Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Disruptive Technologies for Improving Disease Resistance in Crop Plants, So Many Genomes and So Little Time. I am Judy O'Rourke of Labroots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Labroots and sponsored by Dovetail Genomics. Dovetail Genomics is transforming genomics by making long-range genomic information readily accessible to all. The company enables researchers and clinicians to solve complex problems involving de novo assembly, structural variation, cancer research, and more by providing a comprehensive view of the genome. Their proprietary proximity ligation and informatics approaches simplify genomic discovery by integrating the highest quality long-range genomic information with next-gen sequencing output. For more information, please visit dovetailgenomics.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. This webcast is designed to be interactive, and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can, and any that are not answered live will be answered by email. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. And if you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speakers. First, Brandon Rice. Brandon is the Head of Product Development and Strategy at Dovetail Genomics and was a founding member of Dovetail. He did his graduate work at UC Santa Cruz in the lab of Ed Green. Prior to his graduate work, he worked in the informatics and software development at NCGR where he studied metabolic and hereditary susceptibility to severe outcomes in sepsis. And next, Richard Mitchellmore, PhD. Dr. Mitchell Moore is a professor of genetics in the departments of plant sciences, molecular and cellular biology, and medical microbiology and immunology, and director of the Genome Center at the University of California, Davis. He is passionate about classical and molecular studies of disease resistance in plants. Dr. Mitchell Moore's research is focused on answering questions such as, why do pathogens attack one plant and not another? What are the genetic changes underlying adaptations in resistance in plants and virulence in pathogens as they co-evolve? And how can answers to these questions be used to provide more durable disease resistance in crops and improve global food security? I will now turn it over to Brandon and Dr. Mich Dr. Mitchellmore for their presentations. Thank you, Judy. Uh, so I will begin by giving you all a, an overview of who we are at Dovetail and what we do and some of our core technologies as well as some of the projects that we've worked on. So at Dovetail, we are genome assemblers. We do everything that is needed to go from a sample to a full genome assembly, including DNA extraction, library preparation and sequencing, all the computational aspects, including the full de novo assembly and the scaffolding, with various data types. <clears throat> We're a, a service organization, so everything is done on site. Nothing, nobody has to worry about doing anything in their own lab. We are particularly good with proximity ligation technologies, of which Chicago and High C are two. And these technologies are really nice for doing genome assembly, as I'll show you here in a few slides. And we've been at this for a while now, having done over 200 genomes uh, delivered to our customers and many more on the way. This is a, a glimpse at the menu that we have. As I mentioned, we do everything that you need to get from a sample to a genome assembly. In particular, we are very good at high molecular weight DNA extraction, and we can make both conventional Illumina shotgun libraries and conventional PacBio libraries, as well as our proprietary proximity ligation libraries, which are Chicago and Dovetail High C. The Illumina and PacBio data are great for de novo assembly, and the Chicago and HiC are great for scaffolding to get you up to full chromosomes. We uh, also perform the computational aspects of things, of course, and for the Illumina de novo assemblies, we use a tool called Miraculous from the JGI, and for the PacBio assemblies, we use the Assembler Falcon that is produced by PacBio. And then we have our 
own in-house pipeline called HiRISE that's purpose-built for taking advantage of the unique features of proximity ligation data for scaffolding any type of assembly. So uh, as I mentioned, our core technologies are these proximity ligation data types, and those are illustrated here. The principal difference between these are where you begin and where you end. So Chicago begins with pure high molecular weight DNA that is first reconstituted into uh, chromatin, which in this cartoon up top, the DNA is the black strand, the chromatin is adding histones, which are the blue circles. Um, once you have added the, uh, created the chromatin, then you've put all the pieces in place that you'll need to carry out the rest of the protocol. For IC, we begin with native uh, in situ chromatin, which is fixed in place in the nucleus. And then uh, after both of those processes, we get to uh, the common panel, which shows uh, a cross-linked chromatin molecule. And so what has been accomplished in both cases by the cross-linking is bringing um, bits of the DNA that are distant on the sequence close together spatially. And that's the key to these technologies and how they uh, uh, enable you to access very long-range information on conventional platforms like Illumina sequencers. So there, once you have the cross-linked molecule, then we're going to go in and we're going to cut that up with a restriction enzyme. That is going to turn that one original long molecule into many short fragments, but the association is retained between those fragments by the cross-linked backbone. Once you've gone and cut it up, then we go and we fill in the ends to make them blunt and prepare them for ligation. And while we're doing that, we also add a marker that we'll later use to enrich for the most informative molecules in the library. And that's the green circle in this cartoon. Uh, on the next step there, we are going ahead and ligating, performing random ligations within these chromatin aggregates. And, you know, the, the ends will find whatever ends they may, and they'll link up and form new chimeric molecules in the vast majority of cases. Once you've done that, you've effectively created your, your sequencing molecules that you're going to actually go ahead and sequence. So then you can reverse the crosslinks, get rid of the proteins, and then on the far right of this panel, we're showing now that we're back down to just pure DNA, although it's been transformed a bit. The uh, markers, the green circles, indicate the, the remaining markers that we added earlier on, and those are enriched for uh, chimeric fragments. And so if you look at the numbers one and two, if you follow them along through this cartoon, you can see that at the very beginning, they're very distant in sequence space, perhaps 100 kilobases apart. But after we've gone through this entire process, we've linked them together into one short sequenceable fragment. So then if you want to begin to get a sense of the, the form of these data, we can take the read pairs that we get out of these libraries, we can map them to a reference, or a human reference, for example, and then we can look at the distances spanned by the read pairs. And that is what's being plotted here. So this is two data sets, one Chicago data set, which is in green, one high C data set, which is in purple. And it's the same data in both plots. The only difference between the two is the x-axis scale. So on the x-axis, we have the genomic read pair separation. And then on the y-axis is the proportion of read pairs in the library at a given separation. So if you look first at the left plot, I've drawn a couple of lines on here to help appreciate the scale of this information. So we've got sh conventional shotgun data, which is on the order of hundreds of base pairs. And then there are mate pairs, which typically span from 1 to 10 kilobases. Long reads like PacBio or, Ox or ONT are spanning tens of kilobases, or in the very, very best cases, hundreds. Uh, and then we've got other typical scaffolding technologies like optical maps or um, others which can span distances up to about 100 kilobases. So those lines help you appreciate the scales. Uh, then the curves are the, the real Chicago and high C data. And so you can see uh, the Chicago data has this kind of characteristic decaying insert distribution that will go out to the maximum length of the DNA that we put into the library preparation. Typically, that's between 100 and 200 kilobases, and this is a typical library. So you can see that the signal kind of decays and decays until eventually it falls into the noise, looks like, in this case, at about 200, 250 kilobases. 
that is a consequence of the beginning with the high molecular weight DNA with Chicago. It will, this insert distribution will span as large as your DNA. The high C is different because the DNA is fixed in place in the nucleus. And so your contacts span the entire range of possible distances that can be spanned, including up to the full length of the chromosomes. So on the left plot, you can see it's a very similar distribution for the high C data, although it declines much more slowly. And that's because much more of the data spans long, longer distances. So on the left plot, we're going out to about 500 kilobases, whereas on the right plot, we're going out to 100 megabases. And I've drawn a black line on the right plot to indicate the maximum extent of the x-axis from the left plot. And you can see that this, this high C data is really beautifully spanning well out to that 100 megabases before it's dropping down into the noise. And that is ample signal for scaffolding assemblies into full chromosomes. So now I'd like to give an example of a project that incorporates both of these data types to go from nothing or tissue to begin with and all the way up to full chromosome assembly at the end. So the pro project that I'm showing here is a bird. It's Bob White that we did with Brant Faircloth at LSU. And we uh, performed this entire project. So we, Brant sent us some tissue. We extracted the DNA and prepared shotgun libraries and Chicago libraries and also uh, high C libraries directly from the tissue. And what's being shown in each of these plots, and we'll see a number of these, so I'll take a minute to orient everybody, is uh, each um, square or, or box on these plots represents a scaffold from the assembly. The data that is being plotted within those boxes, uh, in all cases, is high C read pairs, and it's specifically the density of high C read pairs. So. Uh, more intensity on the color scale in, indicates a higher concentration of high C read pairs mapping um, across any given pair of positions in the genome. So pairs that are close together in these plots will fall very close to the diagonal and pairs that are far apart will fall further and further from the diagonal. Ideally what you like to see if you have a perfect assembly is a nice strong signal along the diagonal and little else out too far from that. So on the far left here, we have a, a picture of the high C data as mapped against, mapped and plotted against the initial de novo assembly that was generated only from shotgun data. And the scale here is quite a bit different from the other two. It only goes out to about 80 megabases, and that's just because the pieces are so small that you wouldn't be able to see them otherwise. But each of these little blocks is a little contig or scaffold that you get out of the shotgun de novo assembly. Once you have gone in and scaffolded using the high-rise pipeline and the Chicago data, you get to the middle plot. And so here, now we're, we're seeing the full genome scale. This is the entire genome now that's being plotted, not just 80 megabases. And you can see that everything is starting to come together very nicely. And so the, the scaffolds in this case are ordered from biggest to smallest. And because we're plotting the high C data, you can see a lot of joins that will be made eventually, but haven't been made yet by the Chicago data. Nonetheless, these scaffolds are, uh, greatly improved compared to the de novo assembly. Finally, on the right, we have the scaffolded assembly after we have applied the dovetail high C data, and now we're seeing beautiful full chromosomes. So uh, despite the fact that there are many small scaffolds here, each of these is, in fact, a, a full chromosome. Birds are known to have these many of these microchromosomes, and that's what you're seeing here. Uh, so there are many of them, but each one of these is, is a full chromosome. And we did this project with Brandt in uh, right about two and a half months, of which six weeks was sequencing. So we are able to turn around this beautiful, high-quality assembly very rapidly. So I'll show a few other examples because uh, we have applied our technologies and our pipelines to pretty much every type of critter imaginable. Um, all of these have gone through a similar process. In some cases, the customers made the de novo assemblies and gave them to us to scaffold, and others we made the de novos ourselves. But they've all had Chicago and high C applied to them. Uh, along the top, you can see the progression of the M50s as you apply the different data types. So the de novo assembly on the far left, the N50 after scaffolding with Chicago in the middle, and then the final N50 after scaffolding with high C at the end. Although that final M50 is, it gets to be a bit meaningless because at that point we have full, um, full chromosomes, so it really just becomes a measure of the, the average size of the chromosomes in the genome. 
On the left, we've got a lizard. You can see we went from 500 kilobase added Chicago, got to 15 megabases, and then after adding high C, it got up to 90 megabases. And I believe this is something like uh, 19 chromosomes that were expected, and we get 19 nice big scaffolds. In the middle is a fish. Uh, I know it's a bit harder to see than the others, and I apologize for that. This one has something like 23 or 24 chromosomes, and again, nice improvement from Chicago from a very fragmented input, 24 kilobase starting point, uh, up to 12 megabases, and then again, after adding the high C data, we're back up to full chromosomes. And then finally on the right is the uh, project that we have been working on with Richard for, for some time, and he'll tell you, he may tell you much more about it. Uh, this is a lettuce. So here we have the assembly that Richard handed us to begin with, which had about a 500 kilobase and 50 to start. After a number of different Chicago libraries of different sizes, uh, we got up to about six and a half megabases, and then after adding the high C, we're again back up to nine super scaffolds for nine chromosomes. So it works really well on pretty much anything you can imagine. We've seen all the challenges that they are, uh, that are out there in genome assembly. We haven't solved them all yet, but we're working on it. And one challenge in particular that we're, we're tackling right now and are making nice progress on is polyploids. So, this is a project that we did with uh, Dan Roxar and his collaborators at JGI. This is uh, a tetrapoid grass, Miscanthus, and what you can see on the left is one of our, we call these linkage density plots, the same as the other ones that we looked at where we're, we're plotting the high C data against the scaffolds. And you can see that same kind of nice big chromosome level scaffolding with you know, at this scale, good order and orientation. So we're happy with that. But because it's a polyploid, there are additional challenges that arise, so we wanted to, you know, take a closer look. And on the right, what we're doing is showing a mummer plot of the Miscanthus against the sorghum. So these two are about, these plants are six million years diverged. The, um, the genome duplication event in Miscanthus is thought to occur about four and a half million years ago. And so when you compare the, our Miscanthus assembly against this high quality sorghum reference, you see exactly what you'd expect to see, which is uh, two copies of each sorghum chromosome in Miscanthus. And they appear to have very nice uh, collinearity for the most part with the sorghum. And the one or two major differences that you can see are real differences between the two, and those have been validated by these customers. So, it looks good compared to the sorghum. We're getting a couple scaffolds for each of the sorghum chromosomes, but you still want to know if we're properly separating the homeologs. So these collaborators also, thankfully, had some uh, a genetic map, and so we were able to go in and see how well we were separating the homeologs. And I apologize for the poor labeling here, but wanted to be sure that I was able to get this in, so did it in a hurry. And what we're looking at here is the um, genetic markers along the x-axis, so each column there is a linkage group, and we're looking at our scaffold, or the scaffolds of our assembly along the y-axis, each box being representing a scaffold. So in the best case, what you see here is a perfect correspondence between one linkage group and one scaffold. If you're mixing up the homologs, uh, and, and, you know, putting some of subgenome A along with B, you're going to see uh, any given scaffold spreading across multiple linkage groups. But uh, nicely, we don't see that here. We see a very nice separation of the homeologs um, into their respective and separate scaffolds. So we're very, very pleased with this. This, of course, is not an entirely turnkey and automatic process. It does take a bit more manual effort to uh, finish off assemblies like these, but we are working on automating that further and are happy at least to have an approach to um, to, to assembling these. So lastly, I will finish out with a note on the nice complementarity between these two data types, particularly for fragmented inputs like de novo assemblies that begin from shotgun data alone. It's really nice to have both the Chicago and the high C data. Uh, the Chicago for getting nice very accurate order and orientation and taking you from that low contiguity input to an intermediate scale that's more suitable for use with the high C data. And then of course the high C data is really nice for getting you up to full chromosome length scaffolds. 
And to you know, drive home this point about the importance of doing this in a stepwise fashion when you're starting with more fragmented inputs, uh, we're plotting some data here. So this is real data from uh, one of our assemblies that was scaffolded with both Chicago and High C. And along the top, uh, in, in all of these plots, we are plotting uh, a single scaffold. And each of the dots represents a single read pair mapped to that scaffold. And the x-axis position of the dot is the midpoint of where they map to the scaffold. And then the height, the y-axis position of the dot, is the separation between the two. So you can see there's quite a bit of density close to the bottom of the plot, and then less and less as you get further away, as you would expect based on those insert distributions that we were looking at earlier. So along the top, we have the, uh, the scaffold in, with all of the contigs within it in what is presumed to be the correct order and orientation. And then in the bottom plots, we've gone ahead and introduced uh, artificially, manually, uh, 50 kilobase inversion, and then replotted the data. And so uh, we have the Chicago data on the left side and the high C data on the right side. And so what we're trying to show here is the, the very strong signal for detecting that error, that inversion of the contig within the scaffold in the Chicago data, that is no doubt present in the high C data, but much, much harder to see. And so I'm, I'm guessing that you have probably spotted it by now, at least in the Chicago data. If you can see it in the high C data, then give me a call. I'd love to talk to you. But if you haven't, uh, there it is right there. And so you can see that there's this increased concentration of Chicago read pairs that are kind of further away than you would expect them to be from the bottom of the plot, which indicates that they are further apart on the genome than you would expect them to be. And that's a very nice signal for detecting and correcting uh, misjoins or misorientations or not making those types of mistakes in the first place. So with that, I am all set and we'll turn it back over to Judy. Thank you, Brandon, for your informative presentation. We will now hear from Dr. Mitchell Moore. Great. Well, uh, thank you for joining us. I'm just going to spend about 30 minutes or so describing some of the interactions that we've been having with uh, the Dovetail technology and how we're putting them to use. So, you know, <coughs> we, we live in interesting times in that we have at our disposal increasingly very powerful technologies that are really disrupting uh, our ability to um, do plant genetics and use that knowledge for crop improvement. And there are a series of the ones that I've listed on this slide here. Obviously a major driver for this is DNA sequencing. We're getting incredible throughputs, particularly from the Illumina machines. We're getting even longer reads. This is leading to chromosome scale assemblies that are a foundation for a lot of the work in terms of doing genetics and manipulating crop traits. We're getting even simpler instruments like the Oxford Nanopore. And that's opening us uh, the ability to look at epigenomics, which up to this point we've been uh, somewhat ignoring because we didn't really have a chance to the technology to be able to analyze it. And then the, so the, those top characteristics are really our ability to characterize variation. And then, of course, we can actually do something about it using the genome editing technologies. This has been leading to unprecedented amounts of data, and this is a big challenge. And therefore, having people that are experienced in handling very large data sets and getting the data out of it that we need is obviously both a need and an opportunity. And I'm not going to deal with the bottom three opportunities there, but today really I want to focus on uh, the applications of Dovetail's technology. Now the group of plants that my lab has studied for many years are members of the Compositi family, otherwise known as the Asteraceae. They're characterized by their compound flower, and in fact, the uh, compositive family is probably the most successful plant, uh, flowering plant family on the planet in terms of the number of the species and the diversity of habitats. It has over 1,600 genera, over 20,000 species, and it represents over 10% of all angiosperms. And one of the attractive things about this group of plants, too, is that they're colonizers of disturbed habitats. So potentially they are um, a great source of alleles for um, looking at adverse environments. 
there are over 200 species domesticated, edible, uh, medicinal. Uh, also, there's a lot of weedy species, and many of the ornamentals, gerbera, chrysanthemum, and things like that. Of course, they're all composite. However, the family doesn't have uh, any of the real sort of big six crops, so it's a bit of an orphan family in terms of um, deploying genomic resources. And I've been part of a consortium of labs that are trying to rectify that situation. But some of the more famous crop species that we have are lettuce, sunflower, safflower, artichoke, and then the medicinals like uh, artemisia, echinacea, and the famous weeds, things like science, dandelion. All, of th all your thistles, they're also uh, members of the composite. But the, most of my lab's efforts, um, <clears throat> well, you can see from this slide, I like to joke we're sort of tightly focused on about eight different projects. Part of my lab is focused around on lettuce, and then we have the Composite Genome Project. Uh, within the Composite, my lab has been studying chicory, endive, and artichoke. We're also very interested in the molecular base of disease resistance and its pathogens, uh, particularly the downy mildews. So uh, I've got a number of projects with Dovetail, uh, the ones that I'm primarily the, the PI on are circled in red, and ones that we're collaborating with uh, are more dotted lines. And the, uh, we've also, because we're a technology-driven lab, uh, we've got sidetracked into sequencing, doing genomics on pistachio that I'll talk about later. And uh, we have a number of other projects. So I'd say much of my lab over the years has been focused on lettuce. It's uh, a good diploid. It's got a genome size of about the same size as humans. We've now sequenced it, as I'll describe in a moment. It's an ancient uh, archaeopolyploid. Uh, it's probably domesticated as a weed. It's now over $2 billion per annum um, farm gate value in the US. 80% of that production is in California. So we're about 4% of the agricultural uh, economy in California. OK, so when you're online, you may want to keep going back to this slide, because this really lays out this talk. And uh, it, it follows how we've been putting the genome assembly and refining it over the years. So just to walk you through it on the left-hand side, uh, <clears throat> about five, six years ago, we collaborated with the BGI, and they did a really great job of putting together the primary assembly. It was all Illumina-based. And that gave us version 3. We then uh, genetically validated the assembly, cleaned it up a bit. And in both cases, we did annotation. That gave us V5. Now then we took the genetics and however many scaffolds that we could map, that generated V6, which was everything we could map into pseudomolecules. Uh, and then we took V5 and did two lanes of Chicago. Oh, it must have been about 18 months ago now. Well, that led to V7. And again, we checked it out genetically and uh, constructed pseudomolecules. That gave us V8. At the same time, we did some more Chicago. I'll go into great detail in a moment. But uh, that gave us um, from V5, the input, that gave us 7.2. And again, we did genetics and constructed pseudomolecules on that. That gave us uh, V8.2. And then we, uh, high C came along, and so we generated V7.3 uh, and with a modified version of high rise V7.4. So I'm now going to walk you through uh, these different stages so we can get a, a better look at how things went on. So I said the first input, uh, or first uh, genome assembly, was uh, straight Illumina based. We made a whole bunch of libraries, uh, or rather BGI did, uh, good mate pair libraries all the way up to 40 KB. And so <coughs> we had about 110x uh, raw sequence that was polished, dropped down. And when you're doing Illumina sequencing, one of the very important points is to work with really high quality sequence. Don't try and incorporate bad sequence. Uh, if you need more reads, sequence them more and throw out the bad reads. They ran uh, SOAP de novo. We could add in genetic data, gene space data. Uh, we had transcriptome data, and that gave us our annotation. So uh, <clears throat> what we ended up with was an N50 of uh, 476 KB, which for the time was pretty good 
for a uh, 2.7 gig genome. And <clears throat> we, we got 93% uh, assembled, close to 40,000 gene models. We could, uh, well, when you get assemblies back, it's very difficult to know how good they are. You know, how does the assembly reflect what's actually on the chromosome? How we were able to look at the scaffolds, pull out polymorphic markers, and use our genetics. And what that showed was that many of our, um, if we got th three uh, good markers, we were able to show that actually uh, the majority of the assembly was genetically validated. Only um, <clears throat> about 0.3% uh, mapped to three or more linked groups, and therefore probably misassembly. So um, that allowed us to align 60% of the assembly, 5% of the total, into chromosomal linkage groups, which at the time, five, six years ago, we were fairly pleased about. However, forget the numbers. This is really what the Lev's genome looks like. A lot of retrotransposons, and the genes are buried in this mass of repeats. So this really puts a challenge on doing genome assembly with Illumina reads. So then we uh, heard about the Dovetail Chicago libraries at a PAG meeting. That must have been uh, <coughs> several back now. And we uh, collaborated with them. They ran the May Chicago libraries, ran high rise. And they say this gave us V7. And you can see the big jump here. This was two lanes of Chicago. And we jumped <coughs> from an M50 of 476 KB up to 1.8 megabases. We could then genetically uh, test them. And only 25%, that's less. 25 uh, scaffolds, less than 1% were chimeric. And the super scaffolds tended to map into nine chromosomal linkage groups. So we had then about 3,000 super scaffolds, coming 2.3 gigs, 97% of the, of the assembly. And because they were large, we could then orientate the super scaffolds. We could locate a recombination point within the super scaffold and that allowed us to uh, considerably increase the resolution of the pseudomolecules. So this is what the genome looked like. This is the VSM, uh, V7 genome assembly that's just been published in Nature Communications. And I uh, say so we're, <coughs> we're fairly happy with that. It allowed us to look at the archaeopolyploid uh, g whole genome uh, duplication or triplication, which is shown in the middle. So every part of the, or many parts of the lettuce genome are actually in triplicate. You can see by the different colored lines joining three parts of this genome. Now, as I say, there were some things that uh, <coughs> we put together genetically into the pseudomolecules, chimeras, that the dovetail information said they were chimeras. Uh, it wasn't very many. It was only 74 scaffolds out of 21,000. But then when we went back in and actually had a look at the uh, scaffold per se, we could actually see what the problem was that uh, <coughs> the Chicago data had actually revealed the misjoins, which was because we had high quality SNPs one side, but at the breakpoint that they accurately predicted, you can see quite why we had relatively few um, SNPs and they weren't high quality. So it was very useful to keep seesawing backwards and forwards between genetics and the Chicago data. The other thing you wanted to do to validate it was we could take the largest uh, super scaffold in V7, and <coughs> which was 12 megabases, and we could then look at the component scaffolds that have gone into making that up. And then we could look at uh, RILs, recombinant inbred lines, and select those that were recombinant across this interval. And then we could see, actually, that the, in, the component scaffolds had, in fact, been assembled in precisely the, cr the correct order. So there's, <coughs> there's a couple of double crossovers. But basically, it was very, very unambiguous that the um, 
high-rise had done a very good job of assembling the component scaffolds into this large super scaffold. Okay, so we're very interested in disease resistance genes. Uh, disease resistance genes in plants tend to be clustered in these last clusters, and lettuce is no exception. For example, uh, our major is what we call major resistance gene cluster two. It's got eight specificities uh, to downy mildew resistance genes. It's got resistance to root aphids. But when you go in and look at the sequence, the assembly, it's got large numbers of these canonical uh, NBS LRR genes, or the NLRs. It's got receptor-like kinases and a bunch of other genes, as, as depicted up here. Uh, if you go to the, lo the lower half of this slide, you can see that the, the gene models predicted there, and it's a mixture of both uh, the so-called CNL type and the TNL type. And we have these genetic bins, so the genetic resolution here. And what you see, though, is that the genes are within sometimes a genetic bin. And we don't know the order or the orientation of the scaffolds within the genetic bin. So <clears throat> here, this is all the dissection at the top. You've got the, the component scaffolds in, in dark blue. Uh, from Soap De Novo, and in lighter blue you've got the genetic bins, and you can see that we've got multiple scaffolds within a genetic bin. But within the super scaffold, then, you've got much better resolution, and therefore we're able to order on the local scale the component scaffolds that were coming from the Soap De Novo assembly. So the resolution of the genetic and physical maps are now similar, which is very informative. But it was still, you know, we, we wanted to get better. And so uh, we persuaded uh, Dovetail to try and get ultra-high DNA, which they did from seeds. And this then allowed, as, they say, as uh, Brandon was saying, it's very much driven by the size of the input DNA. And the initial Chicago libraries were 100 KB. That gave us about two lanes. It gave us about 72x coverage. And I've just sort of... <clears throat> summarize those stats for you already. With the V2 assembly, we then made two additional libraries with genomic fragments as shown here as being well over 200 KB. That gave us an assembly coverage of at least 130X. And then this allowed us to raise the N50 up to 6.5 megabases, which is contained in close to 400 scaffolds. So the, uh, using the larger DNA and greater coverage gave us a good bit better resolution. Then uh, the Hi-C came along, and we've actually made three sets of Hi-C libraries uh, from dry seeds, from young expanded leaves, and from flower buds, because I wasn't sure. I felt the, uh, the chromatin packaging, the in vivo packaging, might actually be denser in the dry seeds, and therefore it might be more informative for long range the long-range contact information. However, I needn't have worried because uh, the, on, the only high C data we've used to date uh, with high-rise has come from the young expanded leaves. And uh, what we ended up was, was basically nine chromosomal super scaffolds, and, uh, which we were, so we, we did feed it a very good input assembly. So the input assembly was 6.5 uh, megabases, you add in the high C data, and basically we've got chromosome scale assemblies. <coughs> this is shown here. So uh, the M50, as I say, is 295 megabases, uh, which is pretty meaningless. Uh, the N90, that's 90% of the genome, is 193. So 99% of the assembly are in these chromosomal super scaffolds. I mean, I like to joke that the, the tomato folks will never have an N50 as big as mine because their chromosomes are smaller than my N50. And if you think about it, there are several uh, Arabidopsis genomes end to end in one of these super scaffolds. It gives you a feeling for the, how impressive the scale of these assemblies is. And when we uh, <coughs> validate that genetically in the right-hand dot plot there, you can see that we get very good uh, diagonal lines for each of the chromosomes. There's a little bit of noise 
that's uh, shown here going across. But we've got the nine large superscaffolds that are basically collinear with the nine chromosome linkage groups. We had a, another six smaller superscaffolds containing quite a few scaffolds. You can actually see them, just a, a trace at the, the top of the left-hand figure or the right-hand side there, plus 13 smaller ones. So <clears throat> as I say, we have a background of, of misassignments. Now then Dovetail used this information to polish the way that high-rise is calling the contact frequencies, and you'll have to talk to them exactly what the tweaks were. But this allowed us then to really um, clean it up. The 19 smaller superscaffolds were now correctly placed in the, super, the chromosome of superscaffolds. And you can see that the background chromosomal misalignments has been greatly reduced. And this has now placed 99.3% of the assembly into chromosomal superscaffolds. The other thing we wanted to do was, because we had a number of, of, of projects starting out, was how important was the size of the input assembly? And because we'd done it progressively and fed uh, a very good uh, assembly in with the high-rise data, we wondered whether that was overkill. And so they ran the V5 input, that is the, um, the input with an N50 of 476 KB, plus only the high C data. And what you can see is it's fairly good. You get a nice chromosomal uh, thing, but the, it isn't uh, contiguous. So we had the N50 was 105 megabases, uh, and the many of the chromosomes were split into two to five pieces. So the total of 34 super scaffolds really made, it, made up the whole genome. Uh, for comparison, then, you've got the plot on the bottom left-hand side you can see that with the yellow line there, it's virtually all of the assembly is in these very large molecules. The input assembly is shown in that blue line. And you, so the, the two, um, two plots here on the right left-hand side give you the comparison of the effect of uh, the size of the input assembly, uh, emphasizing the point that Brandon made earlier that the Chicago and HiC libraries are complementary. And then we can look at what that does to the, to the um, resistance gene cluster that I just talked about. The bottom half of this slide I've already shown you, and the top half is really taking in, uh, the green blocks to the input scaffolds from V5, and now they're just one contiguous block all the way along as part of chromosome 2. So really this has reduced almost all ambiguities uh, in... Uh, in, in the genome assembly. And this is actually showing is V7.3, one of the unlocated scaffolds we had before uh, in 7.3 is actually part of this cluster, and V7.4 added this in. So here's a summary table that gives you the stats of walking across the uh, N50 size. You can see we've gone from 476 all the way up to chromosome scale. You've got the, the numbers here. Uh, it's here for your perusal. I don't want to walk through it in the interest of time. But I will make the point that the, from the V5 to V7, there was no new, really no new sequence added. What the whole process was, improved ordering and orientation of the component scaffolds. So where are we going now? We've got about as far as we can, I believe, with our current assembly. So what we're now doing is adding more sequence back in. This is involving PacBio. We've now sequenced 32 smart cells, which is about 15x. We've got some very big libraries in there. Uh, <coughs> we're putting that in, so we're using the PacBio for scaffolding and gap filling. We're also using uh, 10x chromium libraries, which are going to give us fragments of the 50 to uh, pseudo long fragments of 50 to 100 KB region. We'll put that in. We'll then uh, use the dovetail scaffolding with both the Chicago libraries and the high C information. We'll still have some uh, gap filling to do. We'll do that from the um, PAC bio sequences. We'll genetically validate what's going on, we'll then reannotate. And so the V9 will be a completely reworked genome. 
but uh, as you can imagine, it's taking some time to do that. So where are we using this type of information? Well, lettuce, like uh, any good plant, gets all sorts of diseases. We have um, most of these diseases you see on this panel you wouldn't want to see in your lettuce uh, salad. We've got mapping po populations for all of this, and we're really trying to pursue a candid gene approach to uh, clone many of these genes and, and uh, facilitate their integration to generate multi-disease multi resistant lines. So here we've got a heat map of the different linkage groups. We've got all of these phenotypes that are mapped. And as you can see, asterisks have either cloned the genes involved or we're targeting them for cloning. And really having a accurate chromosome scale uh, genome assembly is foundational for these efforts. We've been do doing map-based cloning now for quite a few years, but having a chromosome scale assembly is really uh, accelerating the process and drilling down to candidate genes with much faster with, and with much more confidence. So here's just an example of uh, mapping the phenotypes to the major cluster of resistance genes shown here. I say this is allowing us to drill down and get candidate genes. So, so step back then, I think we're really at the point we can have a relatively efficient resistance gene discovery pipeline, as shown on the top right-hand side here, and we're using the same types of technologies on the pathogen side. Uh, I haven't had time to talk about it today, but, and we're not as far along, but we're using Dovetail's technology on the Bremia pathogen as well. We haven't got any assemblies yet, but hopefully we will in the next couple of weeks. And then we can put these two data sets together, and we can then have a, d a deployment strategy that will hopefully result in much more durable disease resistance. At the moment, the pathogen responds to the selective pressure Im imposed by resistance genes so that quite quickly, if the resistance genes are released individually, they get overcome. So what we need to do is to be able to pyramid resistance genes and then have, have um, deployment of the, of the resistance gene stacks so that we are maximizing the evolutionary hurdle placed on the pathogen population for it to become virulent. And uh, these ideas are not new. Roy Johnson, back in 1984, wrote a very good review that was published in Animal Reviews of Phytopathology. It's worth going back and reading that. Uh, but they really didn't have the technology to implement it. And now I believe we do. And to give a shameless plug for a review that we wrote a couple of years ago, this really takes Roy's ideas and puts them in the context of the opportunities and technologies that we have today. Jumping a little bit, just to uh, illustrate some very recent data uh, on pistachio. None of you would claim that, in fact, pistachio is in any shape or form a uh, model plant species. It's got a, a genome size that's nice. It's only 600 megabases. However, it's dioecious. It's outbreeding. It's highly heterozygous. And really, very little genomics data is known about it. It's actually an ancient domesticate in, from the uh, sort of Persian area, but it's a very recent California crop. It's now about a billion dollars and in increasing. Uh, it's an also an interesting crop because it's grafted. If you look at the tree, the right-hand tree on the, on the, in the top right-hand photograph, you can see a ring halfway up the trunk there. That's the graft point. So you've got one species on the top which is uh, pistachio vera. And actually, the bottom, the rootstock, is an F1 hybrid seedling between two other species. So it's a very interesting uh, set of three species. The crop is really three species, looking at that to, to work out what's going on. And uh, Sally Kafkas in Turkey has devoted much of his life to this. And he's been developing genomic resources. We're collaborating with him uh, to work on pistachio vera. Uh, and the data that we just got back earlier this week, here is uh, a, a chromosome, basically, assembly of the Stachevira. It's material that, uh, based on an input assembly of 78 KB, uh, and Dovetail ran both Chicago libraries and High C, and we're able to get a 23 megabase N50 basically with nine, with nine scaffolds. The longest scaffold is 31 megabases. 
we've got 17 major superscaffolds. Now, pistachio has 15 chromosomes. It's also dioecious, it's got the sex chromosomes. So we're very, very close to having superscaffolds that go across every chromosome, and we've got 98%. Now, there's only 400, uh, 440 megabases of the genome assembly in here, and it should be about, um, but that was the size of the input assembly. Now, the other, uh, the female here, was, had a much better input assembly. Uh, Sally Kafka's uh, generate worked on this much more, and the N50 there is 1.5 megabases. All that was necessary was to have a high C uh, libraries made on this. And now you can see we've got much better, uh, we've got 16 major super scaffolds uh, with 99.9% of the 400 and, uh, sorry, 614 megabase assembly. That's close to the whole genome then in chromosomal super scaffolds. I'm not quite sure where the, uh, <coughs> which ones will have to be joined. It might be something to do with the sex chromosomes. So you know, what we're going to do next there, we need to refine, genetically validate these, but it's looking very good. Uh, we're doing chromosome scale assemblies of the two rootstock parents. Uh, this is going to lead to high-resolution QTL mapping in, both, in all the species for agriculturally important traits. This you know, is going to allow us to, to have very informative molecular markers for selection in this, in this um, relatively long-lived uh, crop species. So I feel this is a very good example of rapid development of genomic resources for a little-studied non-model species. A couple of years ago, we didn't even know the genome size. So to wrap it up then, I'd like to acknowledge a lot of people in my lab that have done much of the work, uh, particularly Sebastian Reis Chim Wo who's really been leading the, uh, the, the, the lattice work. Uh, William Palmer and Yulina Jaxerad have been doing uh, much of the pistachio work. And then uh, Dean Lavelle and Maria Jose and Alex also have been doing much of the background work on the lattice genome and the phenotyping. I uh, <coughs> can't really say enough for the collaboration. There's been a great uh, interactions we've had with a whole series of people at Dovetail. Uh, we've listed some of the names here, and I'm sure there are many others in the background. Uh, the SRI, this has been a great uh, collaboration working on, on lettuce. Uh, and then the Les, International Lettuce Genome uh, Consortium. Uh, this is done in collaboration with a group in Farkeningen who are working on we're a wild species of lettuce and we're going to use Dovetail on that as well. I'd like to acknowledge the funding it comes from a consortium of companies, as well as the lettuce growers and the pistachio research board. Uh, the growers have been remarkably supportive over many years for developing, uh, genomic and apply, uh, developing and applying genomic resources into classical plant breeding, as well as the federal agencies. And with that, I'd like to finish. Thank you. Thank you for the informative presentations. Before we begin the question and answer session, I want to advise that a series of poll questions will appear on your screen. You may select your answers, then close the poll questions by clicking on the X in the right corner. We'd also like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. And our first question is for Dr. Mitchell Moore. Do you feel comfortable now scaffolding only with Chicago high C data and foregoing the genetic map? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I actually think uh, genetics is great. Uh, genetics doesn't lie. And it's a very good independent metric as to how good your assembly is. So if you have uh, genetics, I would definitely uh, use that information. Uh, <coughs> there, there, there will be misjoins, and so I say, yes, you, um, you need to use genetics if you can. However, it's not possible in all species, so you need some other metric. Uh, something we're doing in other species where we don't have genetics is to look for synteny uh, in related species. So if you're doing dovetail in parallel species, you can basically cross-reference both and see whether you get the same uh, synthetic gene order. Uh, Dr. Mitchell Moore, this next one is for you too. 
did you notice any differences in the biological signal between the three different tissue types you used for high C? Okay, that's still a work in progress. Uh, as I said, we thought the uh, high C data from seeds might be more informative than the ones from leaves, but it certainly wasn't necessary. Um, we have just done the first uh, sort of visual comparison between the three data sets, and the predominant signal is for the contact frequency reflecting proximity down the chromosome. We're not seeing very strong signals of interchromosomal associations within the interphase nuclei, which of course was the original reason that high C was developed way back. But as I say, it's still a work in progress, and. Uh, yeah, we, we, we can see sometimes these X's in the uh, high C data, whether that's reflecting uh, the structure. Maybe the telomeres are coming together as well in the nucleus, but uh, as I say, this is still a work in progress. Thank you. Brendan, this next one's for you. Are there any major differences between Dovetail's high C data and that produced by others? Um, yeah, in principle, uh, no, no the, the, the kind of signal within the data is the same from coming from our libraries as it is from others. We do have a, a streamlined library preparation protocol that only takes a couple of days as compared to, uh, you know, some of the, the earliest published protocols are on the order of closer to a week. So we streamlined that quite a bit. Um, we were one of the early folks to adopt high C for tissue as opposed to only for cell culture. So we have worked with an extensive array of different tissue types, and it works uh, for pretty much anything. Of course, there are always limits. Um, but that's on the assay front. As far as the data goes, you know, it's, it's fairly similar. Although, uh, talking to Richard a bit earlier, it sounded like the, the high C data that we produced and gave to him was a bit cleaner in terms of the signal to noise content. Okay, this next one I believe is for you, Dr. Mitchell Moore. Great work on pistachio. How are you planning to deal with the heterozygosity of this species, and would you be able to construct super scaffolds representing the different haplotypes? Hmm. Uh, this is very much a learning curve for us. We actually, it's the same issue with Remia, the, the dining mildew. Both of them have very high levels of heterozygosity. Uh, it's also one of the reasons that we're pulling in the 10x uh, assemblies, because there the initial output, uh, ostentatiously anyway, uh, keeps the two haplotypes separately. And what we're considering doing is submitting to the dovetail analysis <coughs> uh, both the uncollapsed and the one with the, hopefully the haplotype separate, and then the collapsed one, and looking at what we get back. Uh, so I think the jury's out on that one. Uh, you know, it's a similar type of issue as when you're considering dealing with ha uh, polyploids. I think it'll be very much on a species by species, um, or case by case basis, because it'll be driven by the amount of diversity that you see between the informative low copy sequences. Brandon, this next one is for you. Can assemblies generated by any means be scaffolded with Chicago and or high C? And if so, what qualities do you look for in input assemblies? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes, uh, assemblies made by any means can be scaffolded with our data types and pipelines. Uh, as far as, you know, what qualities do we look for, uh, the, you know, the more contiguous the input is to begin with, typically the better the final result will be. So we do like that initial assembly as contiguous as it can be. As far as kind of standard recipes go, when folks are using shotgun data for their de novo assemblies, we always recommend getting both Chicago and high C data to cover kind of the intermediate information scale with Chicago and the chromosome scale with high C. That's really important for those, those types of in, input assemblies in particular. <coughs> Excuse me, when you have a packed bio assembly, in a lot of cases you can go straight to high C and get a really nice high quality scaffolding, um, but we tend to take those on a case by case basis, but we are always uh, happy and willing to consult with folks if they're not sure about their current assembly. We have means to 
assess the quality of those and, and make some guesses around um, how the process is likely to go. So uh, if folks are, are wondering or not sure, you're always welcome to reach out to us. Brandon, next one's for you. How long does it typically take to go from tissue to delivered assembly? That will depend on the nature of the project. Some projects we do are scaffolding only. Some are everything from the de novo assembly through the scaffolding to the gap filling and all the rest. In the fastest cases, typically it's on the order of about six weeks or so. Um, we can do entire projects, including the de novo and scaffolding bits, in the order of a few months, three months or so, and that was the case with the Bob White that I showed, which was done in two and a half months. So um, certainly much quicker than the human genome. I would like to once again thank Brandon and Dr. Mitchell Moore for their presentations. Again, all unanswered questions will be replied to by email. Do you have any final comments? I'm good. All set. Thank you very much, Judy. Oh, great. Okay. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Dovetail Genomics, for making today's educational webcast possible. Please stay tuned for details on their next LabRoots webinar on coffee presented by Dr. Susan Strickler of Cornell University. This webinar has been approved for continuing educational credits. Please click on the CE button at the bottom left corner and follow the process to receive your credits. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 31st, 2017. You'll receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay, and we invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. See you next time. Goodbye.